Okay, let's turn to Proverbs 24. Today we're going to do two lessons on God's purpose for marriage. I forget which numbers they are. Let's see. Lessons uh, 10 and 11. But I want to start with something else here first. Proverbs 24. 3 through 5. I was just reading this this morning and I thought I'll just stand up and share this for a couple minutes here. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. It says, through wisdom a house is built, or a house is built. And we're going to be talking about marriage this morning, and... You know, there are different kinds of ways to present the Word of God, and there are different speakers with their styles, and and I know, I realize I have one, and everyone has a different style. My heart, and I I really take teaching seriously. You know, I could come up here, and I could do a comedy routine, and I probably would enjoy that, Uh, but that's not what I'm really called to do. And so a lot of what I do is I'm trying to help you have a foundation for a wise and prosperous life. And so I teach methodically, and that's just, I feel that's my call. Wisdom and knowledge are, are imperative for you to have a, a prosperous life. And in, in ministry, if you've been in ministry very long, or if you go into ministry, ministry is about people. And as you know more and more people, and you spend time with people, you realize how few people have a good foundation for life. I thank God for my family and for my parents, even though they weren't actively following God. My father and my mother were extremely moral and uh, had uh, uh, integrity and and taught me well. And I I don't take I won't take time to mention some of the things my father did with me in life to brainwash me to the right path. Uh, But he did a very good job. And but not everyone has that kind of foundation. They may come from a family with no father or, or a very dysfunctional kind of family. And so people come and they come to Bible school with very little, uh, few, very few resources in terms of how to live their life, how to to build a a wise uh, family, wise wise home, what have you. So I don't know. I just when I read this this morning, I thought you know it's it's good to hear the other kinds of messages that get us all pumped up and rah rah rah. But we need a foundation as well of, of line upon line, precept upon precept, how we live. How is the, what is the best way to live? How do you make decisions? Uh, for the men that were here at the men's advance, I taught about right and wrong thinking. How to think right versus wrong thinking. These things are key. So when we come to the subject of marriage, and we're coming to the subject of marriage now, what is marriage all about? And when we look in our society and we look around today, you know, marriage is under attack. If you haven't noticed, the whole concept is being bombarded by, by worldly thinking uh, to where marriage is, is simply a, I can do it if I feel like it. I don't have to do it if I don't feel like it. We can just live together. What's the difference? Who needs a piece of paper? Uh, marriage, it can be between a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. It doesn't matter as long as they love each other. Uh, uh, homosexual families can adopt children, they can do whatever they want, it doesn't matter. And so the, old, the concept of marriage as the bedrock of society, as the foundation of, of everything that God wants to do in the earth, is disappearing quickly. And today, uh, they say, well, even the divorce rate amongst Christians is, is equal to or higher than the divorce rate in the world. Well, the reason for that is that Christians are the only ones getting married. Uh, <laughs> In the world, they're not even bothering to get married many times. And so we have this onslaught against marriage, and yet marriage is the most precious thing, the first thing that God created, the first institution, we'll say, that God created in the beginning. Everything is based on this institution of marriage, and so it's important for us to have a, 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 an appreciation and an honor for what marriage is, and we need to understand why marriage even exists. I found a quote today. Because people will say that, uh, well, it's, when, and I may have mentioned this before, but the, the homosexual agenda, I'm, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there and, and be offended, whatever. 
But the homosexual agenda for the last 30 years or so has been to bombard us with TVs, movies, books, magazines, news. Everything is geared toward us accepting and believing that homosexuality is normal. And what I, what I, one day it dawned on me, why do I have to have 30 years and millions, multiplied millions of dollars spent to convince me that something is normal? That must mean it's not normal. If I have to be convinced and bombarded with this year after year, day after day, continually, no, it's okay, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. Well, I think I know what normal is. And that isn't normal, or you wouldn't have to be telling me it's normal. So, again, marriage, now the idea that, well, two, two men can marry, that's normal. They love each other. Well, we're going to talk about these things in more detail, but here's a quote I found this morning. The problem with normal is it keeps getting worse. <laughs> uh, that's good. It keeps getting worse. And so what, what's normal, what was normal 50 years ago is no, it's an abnormal, and now what's normal today will one day be abnormal, and no telling where we're headed. But marriage is something that we need to, as the body of Christ, protect, defend, and reflect what God wants in marriage. It is, we are the, we're the last hope for marriage. And once marriage goes, society is gone. So we need to understand what marriage is for. Why do people get married? Why do people get married? Everyone is in society, for example, when I went to college, you could say, well, why did you go to college? And my answer would be because I graduated from high school. See, it's just the next thing you do. And when I graduated from college, and the way I was brought up, high school, college, job, family, that's how we do things. But I only knew that because I had been taught this is the pattern, this is what we do, but I never stopped to think about why am I going to college? And many times, if we're, we've moved this over to marriage, why do people get married? And sometimes it's the, because the, the girl wants to have the princess wedding. Everything in her is focused toward the princess wedding. That's why she wants to get married, but she hasn't really thought beyond that in some cases. Or they just want to come together because that's what you do. You date, you fall in love, you get married, that's just the, that's just the way it is. Fine, but why? Why are you getting married? What are your expectations? People usually, and we were young when we, well, I was 25, my wife, we were both about the same age. See how I got around that? <laughs> and uh, we, got, we got married. And, and we, had, we were both in Bible school and we had a godly background and you know, we, we had a foundation. And yet still at that point, I didn't really have a, a revelation of why we were getting married other than that's what you do. <laughs> and my expectations, I had one kind of expectation and she, as we found out, had different kinds of expectations. This happens so often that people come together with a different concept of what they are doing. And so if the man comes into marriage with a certain kind of expectation and the woman comes with a different kind of expectation, well, once the honeymoon euphoria wears off and these expectations begin to be realized, what you, what, you thought that's what this was about? Well, I thought it was about this. And then conflict began because there's not a defined purpose of why they got married. They, there's nothing in common as to the foundation of this. It's just that you're supposed to be meeting my expectations. No, you're supposed to be meeting my expectations. Well, you're not meeting my expectations. I think we made a mistake. And so you can you know, play this out. You've seen this a hundred times. Why do we get married? All right? Legal sex. Is that why we get married? Legal sex. All right? That's just, just, I'm throwing things out for you to think about. To make yourself feel complete. Is that why you get married? Now, let me, let me say this. If you are marrying someone to be complete spiritually, you're on the wrong track. Only God can make you complete. What's tragic is when you have two people who think if we come together, we will then be complete. And they're thinking on, it's a spiritual vacuum they're trying to fill through marriage. That's, going to not, that's not going to work. 
Only God can make you complete. You can't find your completeness in another person. Only Jesus Christ in you, the Holy Spirit, can fill you and make you complete. Marriage should be between two complete people coming together to enhance them, each other. But if you're trying to find someone, I need my soulmate. Where's my soulmate? They'll complete me. No, they may enhance you if you do the right thing, if you're both spiritually fulfilled, but the best marriages take place when two people are already spiritually fulfilled and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then they come together. Then there are other areas that, beget, that get enhanced, the mental, the emotional. Those areas become enhanced, but not, you don't get complete by the other person. And if you're incomplete when you come into marriage, then you're going to be have conflict in your marriage because you're looking to the other one, you have wrong expectations. Another reason to get married, because they love each other. They love each other. All right, now I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna shoot straight with you and throw things out here. Where is that? What, is that what marriage is about? We love each other? Okay, what is he saying? Okay. Think about how many couples loved each other and now hate each other. When I was working in the, uh, the correspondence department, it was funny. I, I, I would get letters all of the time. I, why doesn't God give me my mate? Where is my mate? Why? I need to be married. And then I, this, the next letter I read is, I've been married for 30 years. I can't stand this person. I want to get out of this marriage. Give me some advice on how to get out of this marriage. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have you write them. <laughs> because... Love, if love is what brought you together, what is love? Is love an emotion? Is love a hormone? Is love a, a feeling? Is love lust? What is love? And so many people come together because of physical attraction or emotional attraction or what have you, and they think that's love. Then they get, to, they get married because that's what you do. But there's no foundation for this. It's only based on emotions. And as we can see in Hollywood, some of those last only a few days, some of those marriages, because it was all about feelings. So why, why do we get married? Another one, to have legitimate children. See, some people, they, you know, they think that way. Well, we've, we're, I'm pregnant, so we better get married. And you know, I'm not going to delve into the details of all of these different ideas right now, but but the, the point being, many people, if not most, get married without understanding what marriage is about and understanding what the purpose of marriage is. All right, let's go to Romans 8, 28. Now, in second year, I teach... Uh, a course in which one lesson is entitled The Law of Purpose. The Law of Purpose, and I'll just give you a quickie here, but the Law of Purpose is that everything that God has created and everything man creates has a purpose. And if you don't understand the purpose of something, you will abuse it or you will lose it. If you have a new, new iPhone, if you were to hand me an iPhone, I would be lost because to me, a phone is something you talk on, period. That's it. If God had meant us to text, he would have given us little tiny fingers. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. So I just use the, the phone to talk on. And that, that, that baffles people, but that's what it, I, that's, you know. So if you hand me an iPhone, I don't know what the purpose of this thing is. My two-year-old granddaughter can scroll and hit things and watch YouTube and do all of this stuff. I have no clue. I don't know the purpose of the applications and all of this stuff. I have no idea. So if you were to, to bless me with an iPhone, it probably would be a curse because I don't know what this is. I don't know the purpose of it. We can talk about any number of things like that. If you don't know the purpose of something, then you will either abuse it or you will lose it. If you don't know the purpose of sex, most people don't, you abuse it and, and lose it in the sense of disease and broken relationships and heartache and depression and suicide, all of these kinds of things. When you don't know the purpose of something, then you have no idea what it's for. You have no idea how to make it work right. You're lost. What's God's purpose for marriage? Now, let's look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, 
to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you want to do a neat Bible study, look up the word purpose. Do a, get on an online Bible and look up purpose throughout Scripture. Tremendous Bible study there. The law of purpose. Everything has purpose. All things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. When Jesus appeared to Paul on the, on the road, when he had this revelation, he says, Paul, for this purpose have I called you. And then he began to explain his purpose to him. Purpose shows up in everything. Everything has a purpose. Marriage has a purpose. What is the purpose of marriage? Why do we come together? Is it just because we love each other? Is it just because we want to have legal sex? Why do we come together? What is the foundation for marriage so that coming together and getting married, see, I didn't know this when I got married. <clears throat> we just celebrated our 34th anniversary. Praise God for that. Yeah. But, but <clears throat> I'm older than I look. <laughs> I'm 83. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm 59. But, um, but we've been married for 34 years, and we've had our issues. We've, we've grown a lot, but it was in the last five or six years that I got a real revelation of the purpose of marriage. And that just, and you know my, my affinity to the word revelation. Uh, but when I got that, that just changed my whole outlook. It changed everything. I'll, I'll, I'll tell that story here more in a moment. But everything has a purpose. So if you understand God's purpose in marriage, then you are much more well equipped to have a successful marriage. All right, so let's look at this. I've got this broken down into three purposes. Oh, and I've got something written here in pen that I needed to say. Talking about why people get married and the word revelation. This is what happens when you don't have revelation about anything. Imitation replaces revelation. If there is no revelation, you resort to imitation. I don't know why this exists, but everyone else is doing it this way, so I'll do it that way. And you can take that into any area of life. I don't know exactly what the purpose of, of church is, so we'll imitate what other churches do. I don't know what the purpose of marriage is, so we'll imitate what everyone else does. I don't know what anything's purpose is, so what I do is just do what everybody else does. And this is what we find in church, this is what we find in marriage. We don't, people don't know why they got married and so they simply imitate, and many times they're imitating dysfunctional, other, other dysfunctional marriages. Or they're imitating soap operas. And it's just nothing but arguing and yelling and throwing things because that's what they've seen. That's the imprint they're imitating. They don't have their own revelation of why they got married. All right, so God's purpose in marriage. Number one, I'm going to break this down into three major purposes, and the first one has three subpoints. All right, don't get overwhelmed, but this is good stuff. First, the natural purpose in marriage. Now, I'm going to share a little five minutes here that's something I shared in the men's advance. So, men, if you were here, just bear with me. But the ladies need to hear this too. There is a concept that I don't agree with that there is only one person for every person. There's just the one. Have you found the one? There's only one person for you. This is, I have an issue with this because if God has given us free will in every other area of life, then why do we suddenly make marriage something that's predestined? And there's only one. That's my first problem with it. The second problem with it is if anyone makes a mistake and marries the wrong one, it ruins it for everybody else. Because if Joe was supposed to marry Debbie, and that was predestined, they're the one for each other, and then Joe has a thing for Sue, and so gets in the flesh and marries Sue, what happens to Debbie? Who's she going to marry? Anyone she marries is therefore now the wrong one. And if Joe and, well, who was it, Sue, have kids, they're not even supposed to be here. And I can just see God saying, oh, my word, what am I going to do? <laughs> see, you have real issues if you take marriage and put it into a predestined box that there's only one. Now you've changed your whole theology. Everything else, you, you, can, you can wear the color of clothes you want, buy the car you want, live where you want, do everything you want, but God has predestined a mate for you. 
Well, I don't understand that. Are you saying there's only one person on this earth with whom I can enter into covenant and have family? Only one? I don't believe that's true. I believe there are good choices and bad choices. I believe there are superior choices and very inferior choices. But there are, there are things that you need to consider when you are letting God. God can guide you and help you and give you wisdom. But how many of you know your criteria changes over the years? You, anyone get smarter as they get older? You know, when you're, when you're a, an 18-year-old girl, what you're looking for, you say, oh, he's got a motorcycle and a tattoo. He's, he's the one, you know? And then when you're, when you're 21, he's got a motorcycle tattoo and a job. <laughs> now he's the one. See, and then when she's 25, he can keep his job. He, he's, it's a steady job. So now the criteria keeps changing. To when if she's waited till she's 30, she may not want the motorcycle, the tattoo, or the, the job at the gas station. She may want something a little bit more substantial than that. But when she was 18, she found the one who two years later wasn't the one. Now I need to really find the right one. And this just continues to perpetuate itself because we have this concept that there's only one. When you marry someone, you're entering into a covenant. And you may have made a good decision or a bad decision, but now that is the one. And you have entered into covenant with them, not based on feelings, not based on anything else. It's based on covenant. All right, now I need to... I'm preaching too much. I need to get going here. Okay, so the natural purpose in marriage. Genesis 2.18. I'm going to look at three sub points. They all begin with F. I like to mess with words here. All right. Genesis 2, 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him or suitable for him. First purpose, natural, first subtitle of the natural purpose for marriage, number one, fellowship. Fellowship. It's not good that man should be alone. Fellowship. When you meet someone, when people come together to, see, to seek their mate, I would encourage you, if you're in that stage, and if you're married or, or divorced, or you're not even interested in marriage, or whatever your situation is, still listen to me today, because you, will, you know someone who's married, or who wants to be, so you can be a help to them. When you're looking for someone, encourage young people especially, it's not about signs and wonders and, and, and things of that nature. It's about finding someone who is compatible with you, who has the same vision as you, who has a, a similar purpose as you. You get along well together. You, you can grow together. You've had experiences together. There is enough natural sameness there and spiritual uh, unity to where this can be a good match. This can be something that can grow and develop over the years. It's funny, when my wife and I were first dating, uh, we met at Bible school, like in a situation like this, and we were dating in Bible school, and then later she broke up with me and decided to chase her down. But, <laughs> but she said at one point, she says, because she wasn't real sure that I was the one. And so she said, you know, you're just not the, the man of God that I saw myself with. You're not, you're not a mature man of God like I, that I saw myself marrying. And I thought, oh boy. I thought, so God gave me a word of wisdom. And I said, but Betty Kay, I need you to help me become that man. <laughs> so, 34 years later, you know, we're still together and it's been great. But, but but when we come together, fellowship is 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 key. We we throw this term around a lot. My spouse is my best friend, and you know that should be true. There should be a friendship there, a, a, a union there that that you enjoy the same things. Now, my wife and I have some different interests, and she'll do her thing sometimes in the evening, and I'll do, be doing something else. But we do a lot of things together. We enjoy each other. I like her to be with me. I like her to be around me all the time. We enjoy our, our time together. 
There's fellowship in that. So the first reason is fellowship. It's not good for man to be alone. Let's go to Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Second natural reason is, I used to call it fidelity. I'll call it faithfulness. Faithfulness. Sexual faithfulness. Marriage is made that we might have one person with whom to share intimacy, and that is God's perfect and his best. Anything outside of that is destructive. Faithfulness. A man shall cleave unto his wife. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7.2, and then we'll go back to Genesis. 1 Corinthians 7.2. Faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Or one of the issues of marriage, one of the reasons for marriage is to avoid fornication. And therefore, the idea is that when two people marry and come together, that is a lifelong commitment that they will enjoy together and they will be faithful one to another. But if you go into marriage with that, without that concept, then unfaithfulness is, is rampant. We see that in society. People just simply can't fathom the idea of being with one person because they haven't understood the purposes of marriage. We have more that we'll look at here. But it's based on feelings, it's based on emotions, it's based on convenience, it's based on the, the moment. And then when that feeling ends, now it's time to go find someone else. There's no faithfulness in, involved. And so your character is revealed. Your, we talked about testing yesterday. Uh, well, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but marriage is, is the ultimate realm of testing, so to speak. It tests every part of your character, your integrity, your faithfulness. All of these things come to play in marriage. So it's about fellowship, it's about faithfulness. And let's go to Genesis 128. It says, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Third F. Marriage is about family. Marriage is the foundation for society, the foundation for progress. It's the foundation. It's the first institution that God created. It's about family. And God, in God's mind is these families are going to reproduce and continue to make families and more families and more families. The church is a, is a, a, a group of families. Everything in society is based on family, and yet society is trying to tear family apart and make it a universal global commune that anything goes. All that's doing is, is, is sowing the seeds of our ultimate destruction. Family is key to everything. Jesus had to be born into a family. He couldn't just be born some, somewhere where there was no lineage, no tracing of where he came from and proof that she was a virgin. He had to be born in a family. God's desire, God's heart is that family uh, be, be key in the whole purpose of marriage. All right, let's move on to number two, the heavenly purpose. We have the natural purpose, and now we're looking at the heavenly purpose. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. It says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. The two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I speak concerning Christ and the church. The heavenly purpose for marriage is that marriage represents the redemptive pattern or reality of Christ and the church. In other words, Christ and the church come first. Marriage reflects Christ and the church. It's not that Christ and the church are based on marriage, it's the other way around. Two people coming together, God foresaw the end from the beginning that Jesus was going to be married to the church, lay down his life for the church, therefore Adam and Eve come together, a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves unto his wife, and that is a reflection of Christ and the church. There is a heavenly reason for marriage. Every marriage, no matter how perfect between a man and a woman, every marriage is reflecting Christ and the church in that sense. 
that there is, there is the joining of the male and the female, there is the, the union physically, there is the covenant spiritually, this thing is coming together because this is a reflection of something that God has already done and seen of, of Jesus and the, and the wedding and the, the marriage of the Lamb. This marriage is that, that reflection. Let's go to Hebrews 13.5. Hebrews 13, 5. I want you to think about marriage as a reflection of Christ in the church. It says, let your conversation or conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is a picture of marriage. Marriage is a reflection of Christ's commitment to us as the body of Christ. How many of you would like to enter into covenant with Jesus not knowing if he would stick around or not? And I sure hope he hangs in there. But in marriage, so, so often we come together not knowing if the other person will stick around or not because they don't understand that this is a reflection of Jesus' commitment to the church. So they get married for the feeling of it, once the feeling runs out, they're gone. What does that reflect? Does that reflect Christ's attitude toward the church? No. What does two men coming together to be married reflect? Does that reflect Christ and the church? No. Or two women? No. Why? Let me ask you this. In our modern society where everything is changing and normal is getting worse, and they say that marriage can be between any two people who love each other, all right, so two men get married, let me ask this, why does it have to be just two? Where'd the number two come from? Why can't it be three? Why can't it be four? Why can't it be two men, three women, and a collie? Don't you love your dog? Why can't you marry your dog if it's all about love? See, once you, where, where does two come from? And yet they won't recognize that God instituted this this covenant between two people, a man and a woman, who the man lays down his life for and, and will never leave nor forsake, now it can be two men, which reflects nothing. But why two? And they can't give you an answer for that. And so because there's no answer, the next thing they're going to do is say, well, it can be three. It can be four. It can be five. It can be children and adults, animals. We all can get married because they have no purpose. So when you don't know the purpose of something, you lose it or you abuse it. Now think of this, ladies. If two men can get married, what does that do to your identity as a lady, as a woman? You have become nothing more than an interchangeable part. You are no longer unique. You are no longer special. You are no longer the bride of Christ, so to speak. You, are now, you can be a man. It doesn't matter. You have become, you have lost value and uniqueness. Society has taken, women don't even know this is happening. Women are losing their, their uniqueness. They're, even women are fighting for this, not realizing they're the ones who are losing. That they're not just an interchangeable part. Joe can marry Tom or Joe can marry Cindy. Doesn't, mar doesn't matter. Cindy or Tom, they're interchangeable. Well, then that makes Cindy less than nothing. What is she? She's just another human organism. Where's Christ in the church in this? So you, you begin to see that people are coming together with no clue, no knowledge of what marriage is about. They don't understand the natural purpose. They don't understand the heavenly purpose. The church is the bride of Christ, and God established marriage to reflect Christ's never-ending love for the church. Marriage between a man and a woman reflects Christ and the church. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Second Corinthians 11, 2. Marriage between a man and a woman, just if you get into debates with people outside... And they say, it's no different, two men, two women, man and woman, it's all the same thing. They love each other. Okay, tell me there is nothing unique and different about the union of a man and a woman and the union of a man and a man. 
Is there nothing unique and different about the union of a man and a woman and the union of a man and a man? Do they not have the, the potential for procreation, for being fruitful and multiplying? Is that possible in a man and man, woman and woman union? So it is unique, it is different, it's not the same. If it's unique and different, then that unique relationship needs to be protected. Because it's not the same as a man and a man. I don't care if love is the motivation or not. And when we fail to see that, then we open the door to every kind of relationship that you can imagine, and it will continue to get worse. But if you're going to call that marriage the man and the man, then what are you going to call the unique and different relationship between a man and a woman? It has to be kept separate. It has to be kept as something completely different because it is the foundation of our society. Men with men, women with women will never form the foundation of society. Society will collapse before that would ever happen. So you have to maintain the idea that the union between man and woman is so different, so unique, so special, it needs its own designation. And we call that marriage. Everything else I call sin, but if society wants to call it something else, fine. But marriage has to be marriage, and it has to be held as unique, special, and different. It needs its own legal designation in society. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11.2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's speaking to the church. We are the chaste virgin, washed in the blood. Praise God. And marriage on this earth reflects this relationship of Christ to the church. That's the heavenly purpose. Every marriage, every husband should have this in his head. That no matter how many troubles I have with my spouse, we are still reflecting something to the rest of society that they need to see. See, if you realize that your marriage is a testimony, you would probably work harder on it. Your, your marriage is even more important than the church to the rest of the world. Because the church is only, only going to be a collection of marriages. So if you realize that your marriage is a testimony, it's a powerful witness that the rest of the world is quickly losing sight of, they have no clue what marriage is about. But if, you, if they can see in the union of a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, this self-sacrificing, laying down of the life, presenting one as the chaste virgin to the other, this covenant that I will never leave you or forsake you, that is what the world needs to see. That is a powerful testimony. But today, unfortunately, even in the church, Christians get divorced because they don't know why they got married. They have no clue. It was for mystical reasons, and I thought that was the one, and I blew it, and so I need to, get to find, go out and find the right one. All of these crazy ideas are destroying not only society, they're destroying the church, they're destroying our witness to the rest of the world. All right, number three, the spiritual purpose. We have the natural purpose, the heavenly purpose, and the spiritual purpose. Let's go to Ephesians 5 again. Is this helping anybody today? Yes, Ephesians 5, 21 through 29. Hey, I'm all for romance, I'm all for love, I'm all for all of that. That comes with it. But that can't be the only reason that you get married. You need to know what marriage is for, what it reflects. All right, the spiritual purpose, Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Men, that includes you, to your wives. Submitting yourselves one to another. In the fear of the Lord, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. It doesn't say submit yourselves to every weird, kooky thing, every abuse, every sin that your husband commands you to do. It does not say that. It says submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. If your husband is not acting like the Lord, ladies, you don't always need to submit. I'm getting blank stares. <laughs> See, I've, I've, I've counseled lots of married couples where the husband is absolutely nuts. Well, doesn't the Bible say she has to submit? Yeah, if you act like Jesus. All right.
Where am I? Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Head means covering, protector, provider. Head doesn't mean dictator. Head means the one who is providing, covering. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything, as the church is subject to Christ. Everything revolves around how Christ is, his nature, his character. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it. The purpose, the spiritual purpose of, of, of marriage is the sanctification of both parties. In other words, the continual maturing and growth and strengthening of them as individuals and as a couple through the issues that come up in marriage. Marriage is about and uh, it goes on that he may present the church to himself. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, that they, he that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even the Lord the church. Okay, I only have a couple minutes here, so I'm, I'm sorry I took so much time on some of this other stuff. My revelation was I was married for 28 years before I got this other revelation that I was not to be looking to my wife for my fulfillment, my satisfaction. She was not there for me. I was created to bless her. And that I needed to get my joy, my strength, my peace from the Lord and then minister to her. Amen. I'm not saying we had a bad marriage. I'm just saying that I had wrong expectations for quite a while. And when I realized I don't need her, this doesn't sound right, but listen to me. I don't need her to make me happy. I need a better relationship with Jesus. And in that relationship, I lay down my life for her. I bless her. My, my chief desire is to make her happy. My chief desire is to bless. And you know what that did? That made a much better marriage. And it also, listen to this, opened up more ministry. Because if your ministry isn't with your wife of first importance, if you're not able to minister in your house to your children, to your wife, if you're not laying down your life for them, then don't try to take that product out into the church. Until you can do it at home, forget trying to do it in the church. Amen. Marriage is the spiritual purpose is sanctification. It is laying down your life. Men, as you love your wife, you're literally loving yourself. As you mistreat your wife, abuse your wife, yell at your wife, complain at your wife, expect your wife to do everything for them, actually you're hating yourself. And you're cutting off your potential for abundant life. You're sowing the seeds of destruction in your own heart and your own life because you haven't grasped that Jesus laid down his life for the church. We are to lay down, that's the pattern we lay down there for our lives, for our wives. And the more you realize that my happiness isn't about what she does for me, my happiness comes from God, the joy of the Lord is my strength, that puts me in a position to lay down my life for her. She responds to that, is blessed, she is my glory. And when you see some people's wives, you, you don't see a lot of glory there because they've been abused. So you lay down your life for your wife, she becomes your glory. And in my case, all that did was exponentially multiply our, our, our health, our life, everything, and ministry came from that.